Welcome to Fridays with Coco. And here we are in this season of Lent in which we decided we would think a lot about how Jesus is the ultimate teacher in our lives. Today and this week through the ecumenical prayer cycle, we will be praying for people who live in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania by naming countries each week. We will pray for all the people of the world in one year's time. Well, let's begin over here on the back of this, hmm, not sure. It almost looks like scripture, but it also looks like an eye chart. It's a reading of James chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above coming down from God, who is the God of all lights, and with whom there is no shadow or variation. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Therefore, rid yourselves of all temptations and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. Be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves, and when they turn away, immediately forget what they saw. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You heard it here. We have heard, and we will tell the story. What do you suppose this could be? Well, most of us know it's going to be Coco's poem of the week. And if I can find it here, oh, here it is. Coco's poem is entitled, Make a Spectacle of Yourself. An enigma riddle requires the brain to use at least one problem-solving skill, often resulting in edifying one's life and satisfying one's need to fulfill. A conundrum riddle can be tricky, because of a play on words, i.e. a pun. Pick your type, most of us would agree that an occasional riddle can be fun. I've heard more than a few riddles and some make me groan and some give delight. They always reveal something that was near but just out of my sight. Like, I'm not a can of paint, but my lid can keep out a bright light. Or, I'm not a curtain, but I'm something that should stay closed throughout the night. Or, I have a lens, but part of a camera I'll never be. Or, I'm always found in a socket, but I'm not a plug, I can guarantee. Or, I have an iris, but I'm not a garden with beautiful flowers to see. And one more. I have lashes, but I don't have a whip. Most would happily agree. If you said that the answer to each riddle is the I, you made the right decision. For all those riddles describe this complex body part that allows us to have vision. It is known that 2020 is great vision, and we joked about it a lot last year at least until the pandemic came along, and then we started to look at it with fear. Corrective lenses were first invented by the English friar Roger Bacon in 1263, but it took Johannes Kepler 400 years later to make lenses grow in popularity. Splitting a lens in two for bifocal sight was created by Benjamin Franklin in 1784. The first glass contact lenses 
were invented about a hundred years more. It's time to leave the focus on riddles and the history of optometry behind so that I may reveal something that is truly surprising to the human mind. Believe it or not, our eyes can only view the world as upside down. The brain has to right side up it, much like a smile that can turn into a frown. That was quite an interactive poem this week, and thank you for always educating us. It is important in our times of worship that we are educated about our world and, of course, all those things that people in our world have done. We heard a portion of the letter of James read a few minutes ago on the back of whatever this thing is. And James was certainly of our world. And not only that, James was a brother of Jesus. How cool was that? That we get to learn from someone who actually learned directly and knew Jesus. We have many opportunities for following the teachings of Jesus but most of them come to us through the Bible and then ways that we experience Jesus in our everyday lives. One of the messages, one of the central messages of the reading that we heard today was this whole thing about looking into a mirror to examine ourselves and to not just look away and forget about those things. That was quite an emphasis in this reading. And it reminds me of how sometimes the mirror is not so much the mirror on the wall, but people we know, people who can reflect back, people we trust, maybe some that we haven't come to trust as really close friends yet, but will reflect something back that we needed to see. Have you noticed that in most of these videos, Coco invites other participants or voices to be in the communication about things of our world as well as things from Scripture? Today is no different, and we are going to hear from some people who might be considered a little bit outspoken. All of these people work in different delis in Brooklyn, New York. Let's begin with Bunny Bushwick, who works at the Stack of Bagels Deli on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights. Okay, Bonnie, give us, by the way, number one. National Bagel Day is on January 15th, and that means the Stack of Bagels Deli will have people lined up out the door and down the street waiting for their free bagel. The Stack knows how to make bagels the old-fashioned way, boiled in water for about 60 seconds on each side and then baked. This is what helps form such a wonderful shiny crust. Speaking of things that are shiny, the James reading speaks of God as the creator of all light, but not like the stars or the heavenly bodies, because they all have a dark half of the day and a light half of the day. God's light knows no day or night. This assures us that God sent Jesus into the world to be the true light of the world. If you're as clear as I am about this, 
go ahead and tell everybody about it and don't worry if you make a spectacle of yourself. Well, I think I've been known to make a spectacle of myself more than once a day. Next we have Woody Haven. Woody works at the Lox Bagel on Bedford Avenue in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. Okay, Woody. As a worker at the Lox Deli, I can boast that we have the best Lox in town. Well, at least on Bedford Avenue. Well, at least in Williamsburg. Let's just say we have great locks. The word locks is derived from a Yiddish word. Yiddish being a language that many Jewish people know. James was writing to Jewish people who were relatively new Christ believers. Most of them were people of little means and were being persecuted by the wealthy for not sticking to their Jewish heritage. James encourages us to have patience, knowing that the ways of our faith will be tested, but it always produces endurance. Jesus taught us about patience and endurance by giving his life for us. Isn't it funny that if we do this, by displaying the meekness that James writes about, it can be just as effective as people who do nothing but make a spectacle of themselves. Well, I'll say, well, sometimes, you know, the deli gets a little noisy and you do have to kind of shout a bit just to hear someone that you might be with. Next, we have Benson Hurst. And Benson Hurst works at the Pastrami Deli on Franklin Avenue in, well, I don't know, I always say Green Pernt. You might prefer Greenpoint, I don't know. This is what? By the way, number three. Pastrami originated in Romania. Yeah, I know we pray for those people somewhere. And it is made by first putting beef in a brine for a long time, then drying it for a long time, and then steaming it with spices and other things. At the Pastrami Deli, I'm just one of the crew that does all the work to make what I think is the best pastrami in all of Brooklyn. And I always look forward to National Pastrami Day every January 14th. For sure, anyone who eats our pastrami will remember it for a long time. It's not one of those things that ends up being out of sight, out of mind. James tells us in his letter that if we really hear God's word, we want to be busy doing God's work. If not, it will be like seeing something important in the mirror and then forgetting as soon as we look away, out of sight, out of mind. I know I want to look, see, remember, and maybe shout it so loud, I risk making a spectacle of myself. Thank you, Benson. And next we have Glenn Dale. Glenn Dale works at the Matzo Ball Deli on Nostrand Avenue in the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. What is this going to be? By the way, number four already? How time flies when you're in Brooklyn, I guess. It's almost a scientifically proven fact, maybe, that the heat of matzo ball soup, the carbohydrates in the matzo balls, the hydrating quality of the broth and the chemical properties of the broth all combine to help the human body power through a common cold. And in addition to these 
health benefits, matzo ball soup provides comfort. I'll agree to that. The words of James power through a few things too. Right in the first sentence, he writes that all gifts coming from God are perfect. And they're perfect in two ways. One is the way God gives the gift, and the other is the gift itself. And don't forget that Jesus is the greatest gift of all. Jesus taught us that we can do this too, to give gifts in the name of God and from a pure heart. Wow, that gets me all excited. Maybe I'll end up making a spectacle of myself. Thank you, Glenn. I think I met one of your family before. Okay, and last, we have Fulton, uh, Fulton Street, who works at the Pickle Deli on Remsen Avenue in Canarsie. By the way, number five. Okay, we're ready. Go. I love working at the Pickle Deli every November 14th because that's National Pickle Day. There's nothing like the sounds of satisfied customers crunching on crisp and fresh deli pickles. Speaking of crisp and fresh, God always seems to be making things new, or at least new to us when we need them. The letter of James is a gift teaching us from the historical perspective to not get bogged down by laws that don't always make sense. Otherwise, we're just following the laws for the sake of the laws and not for the good of ourselves or others. James was writing to people who had to follow a lot of cultural and dietary laws. James was writing to assure Christ believers that the true law of God's love is one of freedom, of becoming free. That's something to tell everybody about even at the risk of making a spectacle of yourself. I've learned a lot today, and I also have a lot of things to think about. Coco likes to, as you can always tell, put a lot of things out there, make a few connections, but she always hopes that these are the things that will spark you to have you think about the things you need to be thinking about. Today is video number five in a series of six that lifts up various people who have had some kind of a teaching influence in my life. And today I lift up Emma Dressler. I studied piano with Emma at a summer music school in Vermont just before I went into my senior year of high school. When I went back the next summer and told her that I was going to be moving to Hartford, Connecticut to study organ, she said, well then why don't you just come on into New York City and study piano with me? Sounded like a good idea to me and off I went doing that once a week for the next seven years. Emma lived in a brownstone on Carroll Street in Crown Heights, one block from the old Ebbets Field. When I asked her how I was going to drive into New York and find her house, she said, well, just stop any police person and ask them where Carroll Street, and then you'll find 1058. I felt like I needed a little bit more to go on because I had only been to New York one time in my whole life, and that wasn't driving. So this was a whole new thing for me. After a bit of coaxing, Emma put her brother Leo on the phone, and he gave me some really clear directions that worked out quite nicely. 
Everything about Emma was as dynamic as her thinking that everyone would just know where her house was on Carroll Street. Of the many things that I would like to share with you, but would take several days, I'm going to share two things. The first is how generous and flexible Emma was with her time. My busy college schedule had very few windows of opportunity for making the drive to Brooklyn, which was 125 miles in each direction. We settled on Friday evenings at 10 o'clock, 10 p.m., in which we would work for about two and a half to three hours and then I would get into my little Volkswagen and drive back to Hartford. Every year my schedule would shift and so sometimes we even met at six o'clock in the morning, which meant I had to get up at about 2.30 just to get there in time. But Emma, who was in her early 80s, was always chipper, always glad to see me, and always ready to work hard. Her heart felt gift of flexibility and time was a true gift to me. The second thing that I would share about Emma is that she was given a Steinway grand piano when she was 16, when she entered the Juilliard school before it was actually called the Juilliard. This piano was part of her sponsorship, a type of scholarship that was often given in those days. And the most remarkable thing that I remember about that piano was that the ivory on middle C was worn down through to the wood. There was a little oval circle of wood that you could not only see, but you could feel. In fact, you could kind of run your fingers across the keyboard from bottom to top. The closer to the middle, the more wavy it got because those ivories from back in the early 1900s had been worn down. By the way, number six. The James reading asks us to look in a mirror and to ask ourselves who we are. As easy as it is to look into a mirror to see how we might be flawed and then look away to forget, James is encouraging us to look into the mirror to see who it is that God has created us to be. The mirror is a wonderful image in itself, along with the image that it gives. But it's not really about actual sight. We are to know, know being spelled, I think, with a capital K, K-N-O-W. We are to know who God has created us to be because we are to see and to feel in our hearts the godness or goodness that is there. Do you remember my mentioning that Emma's piano had a middle C that was worn right down through the ivory to the wood. As much as some might think, it must be time to have those keys recovered with something new. This was not true for Emma. That key was one way that helped Emma find her way around the keyboard because Emma was legally blind. Everything in her brownstone apartment had to stay exactly in the same place. And yet, her inability to see as well as others can never prevented her from living life to the fullest. Things like walking to the subway, getting on the right train, making her way into Manhattan to go to a concert, and then making her way back. This was really something that I found very inspirational. And through the years, she told me various things of what happened in her life. For example, 
she was often mugged. And she was prepared for that because she would go to thrift stores and buy old purses and had them lined up side by side on a bureau in which each purse had some Kleenex and a subway token. When someone approached her to mug her, she simply handed it over and had one great story about someone who followed her right up to her front door and she tried to negotiate by offering some free piano lessons. Such was the bigger than life character of Emma. But it tells us that Emma was not going to be someone who would live in fear. And that's a story that can be inspirational to all of us. And I'm sure all of you have known people like that in your lives. I've only told you a little bit about Emma today out of the seven years that we worked together side by side. But why, what a great story for us to reflect on how Jesus taught James and then how James teaches us that even with sight limitations or legal blindness or even worse, on whatever level, nothing can prevent us from seeing or knowing what God has placed on our hearts. It is for sure that Emma, as my teacher, was my musical eyes, for which I am grateful to this day. And more than once, I had to be the eyes for Emma. When I think about that, it helps me understand that we are the eyes, ears, hands, and feet for doing the work of ministry. And for that, we say, thank you, Jesus, for coming to the earth to teach us. All we have to do is tell the story. Even if someone thinks we're making a bit of a spectacle of ourselves. Thank you, Fulton. I didn't mean to hold those pickles all that time. And today we're going to share another piece of music written by Edvard Grieg. This one is called Lullaby. It's one of those pieces that kind of gets a little bit strong at some places and a little bit fast. So maybe this lullaby is uh, helping someone stay asleep who is experiencing uh, some kind of an interesting dream. Oh, look, there's, there's Stinkerbell. And where are... Oh, Scratch and snip. I knew they wouldn't be far, far away. What are you, are you going to help me? Okay, good luck. Here we go.
Close your eyes. No spraying. Let us pray. No spraying. Gracious God, thank you for the many times when others can be the eyes for us and we can be the eyes for others. Help us to look in mirrors that show us as we truly are, as you have truly made us, that we might live according to the will you have for each of us. With an attitude of gratitude, we give thanks that millions of people have now received the gift of vaccines and we will all be invited to the vaccine table, each in our own turn. As we show reverence for life and pray for all of your children and creatures, we give thanks that all of us are sisters and brothers, friends, as Jesus calls us friends. And we especially lift up those who live in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, who you know each by name. Help us to feel connected regardless of language differences or geographical distances. As we continue to live during this time of global pandemic, we lift up all with any health issues, all who are caregivers and all who are transitioning from this life to the next, either alone or with loved ones. We give you thanks for giving us Jesus, by whose living, dying, and rising to new life assures us that we too are promised that new life. As faith-filled people, fill us with your holy gifts of hope, peace, love, and joy. God, for all that has been, we say thanks. For all that will be, we say yes. And we say thanks and yes in the name of the one who gave himself completely for us, Jesus. Amen. May God bless you today. Amen.